Good morning. How y'all doing? Second service, you're more alert than first, right? Ready to listen? <clears throat> Is this a smarter group? There you go. Humble group, right? There we go. I'm Mike Taylor. It's, it's really great for me to be here with y'all today. And <clears throat> we're in a, um, a series, a Vision Impact Series in 2024. And the title of my message is Growing to Engage the World. And I want to welcome you today, especially if you're um, uh, here for the first time or just, you know, a couple, three times. It's really nice to have you here. And I was looking out in the crowd, and there's a lot of young people here. I, I went to Grace College back a long time ago. And I remember seeing gray-haired old guys speak, and I, I didn't always want to listen to them. <laughs> so I, I was really praying for you college kids today. You know, you want to listen to an old guy maybe. But today we're going uh, to hit science. We're going to hit worldview. We're going to touch on economics. We're going to touch on the foundations of why I give and Myra gives the way that we do. And we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, as well as a few other passages. And then we're going to finish up talking about the Fulani, which is the people group that our church is adopting. Um, I've been doing a lot of contemplating and reflecting. Uh, Reg actually asked me three months ago, so... Um, were we in Africa in the last three months? I know we've been in Haiti. Yeah, so I've thought about this in Africa. I've thought about this in the U.S. I've thought about this in Haiti. And just this last week, we, Meyer and I were in Haiti. We got home Friday. And so I've had lots of opportunities to look at different settings as I thought about the message. And I'm, I'm convinced that it's not my eloquent words, if I have any, that would make a difference in your life today, but it's the Holy Spirit. And so that's what I've prayed, is that the Holy Spirit would work through me and use me to expound upon his word for you today. So there are a couple verses that I came across. Uh, my pop always read a proverb every day and a psalm every day, and I try to do the same. So I've read Proverbs 12 a hundred times or a thousand times or two thousand. But this verse never popped out to me until I was studying for this message. And it says... There is one whose rash words are like thrusts of a sword, but the tongue of the wise bring healing. This rash word means to not think through, to poorly think out before you say something. And so I want to be very careful this morning that the words that I share with you on this topic are not rash, that they don't like a jab you in the gut, all right? We juxtapose that with a very important verse that Paul admonished Timothy, and he said, there will come a time when people don't want to listen to sound doctrine, where people will just gather people around them, teachers who tickle their ears. What does that mean? It means to say things that are pleasant. And we know that in our culture today. Sometimes it's hard to share opposing views with people. They get so easily offended by an opposing view. And we don't want to be that way ever in this church. We want to have sound doctrine. And sometimes sound doctrine is a little tough. So as Reg and I, we've probably talked five times. We've met a couple times over this passage, uh, this message. And the last thing he said to me was, Mike, I hope that you can inform, inspire, and convict. So I'm going to try to inform you. I'm going to really try to inspire you. But only the Holy Spirit will convict you. And my deepest longing, which you're going to hear me say at least three times today, I told this to Reg twice in the last two weeks, is that each of us, that's me and you, would grasp the joy of giving to the advancement of the kingdom of God. That we would understand the joy, how much fun it is to be a part of the process of giving to the kingdom of God. So by now, you've heard about our Building Impact Initiative, and I highlighted a couple things up there as I read through it a number of times. I was really impressed with the growth we're seeing in our church. Uh, you know, used to first service was, when I used to come early first service, very few people. 
It was as many as there are in second service. Awesome. Number two, our budget has increased the last four years. People are giving more and more and more. And then we're, it, we're highlighting local ministry, but today we're talking about global ministry, and it specifically talks about the Fulani people. Last week, Red shared with you about the Building Impact Faith Promise Card. And if you were to see my notes right here, before I talked to Reg yesterday, I wrote, this was a well-thought-out card consistent with what I am going to teach today. I had nothing to do with it. I never saw it until I got home from Haiti. And it says at the very bottom in blue, there's no need to sign your name as this is a promise, a faith promise between the giver and God. So we're really hoping by February 4th, you've prayed through this and talked through that, and you'll turn that into the church. In light of all of this, here's what I was thinking about. Why is it some people give to the kingdom of God, but they only give a little bit? Just a little bit. Why is it that some people are incredibly generous? My wife and I have been missionaries for 34 years. We've raised support to work in Africa and Haiti for 34 years. And I didn't say this the first service, but I just remembered one of my best friends said to me, Mike, when you go into a church, don't gravitate to well-dressed looking business people. You're gonna naturally wanna do that because you think that person has capacity to give to you, when in reality what you're going to find is it's the most unassuming person. Now, we also have wealthy business people that give to three strands and to our ministry. But we have been the recipients of incredible generosity, not only as missionaries, but running a faith-based nonprofit in Africa and Haiti. Why are some people stingy and seem to just promote themselves? They're just worried about their future, worried about, do I have enough in my 401k, in my savings account, my stock account? You college kids, right? Your 401ks, your stocks all that stuff, right? Why did people give me stuff that I did not deserve? I can tell you, they're in my brain right now, the number of times early in our marriage when we had nothing, or in Africa when we had nothing, at just the right time, something would show up that somebody gave to us, unannounced, out of their generosity, out of their wealth, they just gave to Myra and me, and it changed our life. It came at just the right time. How come some people are the first to say, one check, I'll take it. And then there's that person that is waiting for somebody to say, I'll take the check. You know, you've been there. Maybe if you don't have a lot of capacity, you can't take the check. But if you have capacity, it's really fun to take the check. Here's what I do know. As I pondered, as I thought through, it has nothing to do with your capacity. And it has everything to do with your heart. Jesus was about to die. It was the Passion Week. And we find a story in Mark chapter 12 where Jesus took the time to go to the temple treasury and to sit down. Back in the day, there were four courts, all right? There was the woman's court, the Gentile court, they mixed. There was a Jewish court, and there was the priestly court. So women and non-Jews were allowed in this first court, and guess what? That's where the offering bowls were. There were 13 of them. They looked just like that trumpet right there. They were made out of brass. When you put your money in them, they made a lot of noise. Can you imagine if you knew that you were going to die on Friday, and on Tuesday you do this story? Jesus goes to that spot. And I read so many different commentators, and they said there could have been 10,000 people milling around, dropping their money in the offering plate. And yet Jesus just happened to see this take place.
The scriptures say that Jesus sat opposite of the treasury and he watched people putting money into offering boxes, 13 of them. Many rich people put in large amounts and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which was equivalent of a penny and he, call, he called his disciples together. So in those thousands of people, he called his followers, his disciples, and he said, truly I say to you, and he only says that a few times in the New Testament. This is really an important statement, guys. This poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the offering boxes. Really, Jesus? She, she put in more than all of these people that contributed? More than that? She put in more than that? Those two little coins? Well, because they contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty and has put everything she had, all that she had to live on. I was thinking about God's economy. <clears throat> it's very different from North American economy. It's very different from the way we think about our money. By giving sacrificially, she entrusted herself to God to fulfill her every need. And as I've been studying this, this is... You know, Meyer and I are finally at a point in life where we have some capacity. We've worked. I worked for 45 years. And God, are you talking to me about giving even differently than I've given most of my life? If you go to Luke 19, you'll find that Zacchaeus, who was the chief tax collector, meaning the chief of sinners, when God got a hold of his heart with this topic, he gave away half of his wealth to the poor, and he gave back fourfold to anyone who defrauded, that he had defrauded. Let me get caught up here. Sorry. So, as we talk about this topic, um, it's interesting. I, I listened to David Platt yesterday. It was my final message on this. I probably listened to 10 different guys preach on this subject. He said, you know... When you talk about this, there's a response on the part of a lot of people, not a lot, but some people who say, this is all the church ever talks about, is getting my money. And So I was thinking, what, what are the types of responses we see in people? Well, we all have an autonomic nervous system, and that is things that are happening automatically in our body today that we have no control over. So you realize that every one of you in here, your heart, if you're a little baby, your heart's beating around 100 beats a minute. If you're my age, it should be beating 70 to 80. Some of these young people that are athletic and strong, they're 50 to 60. Uh, and you have nothing to do with that. There's four valves that are opening and closing, opening and closing in sequence, 70 times a minute, pumping around thousands of gallons of blood in a day. You said nothing to your body about that. You're going to breathe 16 times a minute as you're sitting there on average. You're going to blink every four to five seconds. That's autonomics. You have no control over that. It's the fight or flight. It's called the sympathetic nervous system. And I had a fight or flight situation just a few weeks ago in this very church. Myra and I were teaching. Well, Myra teaches. I help her. I'm allowed to help. <laughs> and we're teaching first through fourth graders. Her job is to teach the Word of God. My job is to herd cats. And we get a call on the phone. It's Jojo, my youngest daughter. And she's crying. And she's like uncontrollable. And I go, Jojo, what's going on? I just wrecked my car. And I go, are you okay? Listen, fathers. Don't ask, did you wreck the car? Did you kill somebody? Ask, are you okay first? Because your natural inclination is to think otherwise. And I said, Joe, are you okay? No, my back is really hurting. Can you feel your feet? Can you feel your toes? I think so. Can you move your feet? Yes. Okay. Your back's probably not broken. Where are you? I have no idea. Can you ping me? I mean, she's smarter than me with a phone. I had to tell her. And poor Sarah Overstreet sees me running up and down the hall trying to find somebody to take care of the kids so Myra and I can get out and go find my daughter in a ditch somewhere. Well, she did break her back. She had a T12 fracture. She did total her car, and I'm telling you, I was in hyperdrive for about 30 minutes, and I could just feel the adrenaline. Well, then we have the opposite of that autonomic system, which is the parasympathetic, which is the calming. 
It's the relaxing. It's the resting. It's the eating. It's when you pick up your little baby and you hold them close to you. And just that feeling, it makes you feel good and warm. It's when you see pleasant pictures. It just brings about a smile on your face. And as I look out at the crowd, you're all smiling. And these two systems are constantly battling one another. And I, I was thinking today that if people understand this idea of truly grasping the joy of giving, then their parasympathetic system has been stimulated. They're relaxed. They're chilled. They're going, okay, maybe I'll learn something more about this today. But those that don't, that have never understood the true value and beauty and joy, their autonomics are stimulated. It's like, what's this dude going to say? How's he going to pressure me? I don't know what your attitude has been, but this could be one response. Another response could be your worldview. It could be the way you were raised, the way that you look at money. A worldview is a collection of our attitudes, our values, the stories in our life that actually inform every thought and every decision that we make all day long. We do things and we don't even know why we do them. I can tie a tie with my eyes closed, but I could not tell you how to tie a tie. But I've been doing it for so long. It's just it's a response. A worldview is how a culture works out in individual practice. So let me ask you a couple questions. As you're sitting there, count one to five with your hand. Just count on your hand. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Now, I saw this young lady do it the way most North Americans don't. Most North Americans go one, two, three, four, five. Europeans, Africans go one, two, three, four, five. Now, if you go with Myron and me to Central African Republic and you ask for five peanuts, you go uku, not five. If your child is six years old in Central Africa, your child is six, not six. If your child's 10, they're 10, not 10. You notice? My kids are always nine and a half. <laughs> so I can't do five. I'm always four and a half. I'm always nine and a half. <laughs> How'd you greet each other this morning? In Haiti, when we see our brothers and sisters, they're not used to hugging. They tend to shake hands. In Bangui, when we greet, we either faire la bise, which is French for the cheek kiss thing, where you actually kind of kiss the cheek. And in Africa, they do it three times. In France, you do it twice. But now, in the last five years in Bangui, you butt heads when you greet each other. Right? You ever greeted anybody from Thailand? You greet like that. How'd you greet this morning? You probably hugged, high-fived, shook hands. Why? Why didn't you butt, Sean, why didn't you butt heads with somebody this morning? Come on, dude. <laughs> oh, you did with your children. <laughs> How tall is your youngest child? This tall? This tall. Well, if you did that in Africa, you would have just said your child is a goat, your child is a cow, because they say my child is this tall. This tall. It's worldview. Do you willingly borrow your neighbor's riding mower? Would you even think about that? Because in Africa and Haiti, you share everything. It's the way that they were raised. Are most Americans hospitable or charitable? Would you rather give your money or share your house? It's the way you were raised. It's what you know. And so that's one way that we're impacted in the way we look at finances and the way we look at giving to the kingdom of God. And then there's the economics that we live in. Okay, we just passed a milestone in the United States of America. Hooray. We're now $1 trillion in credit card debt, first time ever. The average American household, 7900 in consumer debt. That means the debt does not appreciate, things don't appreciate in value. You bought a watch, you bought a phone, you bought a car. Something that's not going to appreciate over time is going to depreciate. And the average American is 7,900. 51% of Americans say they have trouble paying their bills. This is from Dave Ramsey's research. 64% of renters trouble keeping up. 75% of Americans, three quarters of you sitting in this room, are worried about our economy. So we got an autonomic response that we can't control. 
We have a worldview that mom taught us and dad taught us since we were three years old. It impacts the way we look at life. And then we have the economics of our culture today. So, unrecognized responses, autonomics, worldview, and economics all need to be thought about as we look at a building campaign, a building impact initiative. We have a game changer, y'all. As Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have two things. Number one, we have this book right here. And it is full of such valuable information. I forget the statistic, but Jesus talked more about money than he talked about most things. There's so much discussion about it. And we also have the Holy Spirit. So my prayer today, my deepest longing is that each of us, Myra, Mike, and you, would grasp, truly grasp the joy of giving for the advancement of the kingdom of God. So let's look at the word of God. Uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 16. And I was thinking last night about my dad, and, and I think my dad, early in his Christian life, read this passage because it, it impacted his life until the day he died. The church at Corinth was, uh, we're 1 Corinthians 16, the, first, the church at Corinth was founded by Paul on his second missionary journey. He ended up staying there for one and a half years teaching the Word of God to these people. Um, it was in southern Greece. It was a Roman province, often called Achaia. It was very prosperous because it was a major trade route. They had games there that were almost as great as the Olympic Games. It was also known for being a place of debauchery. It's where we get uh, the word pornography from. It's actually from Corinth. But Paul spent a year and a half with him trying to bring about change in that church. And here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, he was talking about collecting money to help the church at Jerusalem. I have already told the churches in Galatia, which is another region, um, so you also are to do. On the first day of each week, Sunday, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that when I come, there's not going to be any collection because you're already going to have put the money together. Now, this is the first correlation between this card and the Word of God, and that is you don't sign it because it's between you and God, okay? So Paul was telling that to these Corinthian people very early on. Now, why were they raising money for Jerusalem? This is where it all started. Why? What's going on in Jerusalem? And I'm thinking to myself, these other little tiny churches spread out all over Greece, why, why were they the ones having to give to the big church in Jerusalem? Well, in Jerusalem, at Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, there were 15 different languages represented, which says there were pilgrims from all over the known world that came to Jerusalem at Pentecost. Acts 2 and 4, there were 8,000 converts. So this church just exploded. Can you imagine if we went from three or 400 to 5,000 people, what the impact would be on this church, on the building, and all the needs that we would have? They had all things in common, and they sold their possessions. So some of them were putting themselves into debt to help other people. And then finally, there were Hellenistic Jews in the church who were Jews that had come back from the scattered Gentile world. And they didn't have jobs. They didn't have resources. They needed help. There was a great famine that history tells us occurred between 45 and 63, and Paul wrote Corinthians in 55. So right in the middle of this famine, these people are suffering from a famine. And then the final thing is Roman persecution. So this church was bad off. So as Meyer and I travel the world, you all can't imagine. I preached last Sunday in Haiti. It was 85 degrees in the church, little wooden benches, couple lights. They had a sound system with a genera generator outside running. Some of the poorest people I've ever been around in my life. The needs, oh my goodness. 
When I preach in Africa, I often preach in churches where people are sitting on logs. No lights, no AC, thatch roof. And this is what we're talking about here. Paul's saying to Corinthians, all right, put a little money aside. When I come back, we're going to take that money, we're going to take it to Jerusalem. Now, as we go further into Corinthians, as he's admonishing them in 2 Corinthians, he wants to make reference to the churches in Macedonia. So Corinthians was southern Greece. Now we're talking northern Greece, where the people were poor, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. These were three of the churches that made up the Macedonian church. So if we go to 2 Corinthians 8, and we're going to just stay here in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Go to 8. This is what he was trying to tell the Corinthians about the Macedonians. Listen to this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among those churches in Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. They gave according to their means once again. We see this again in Scripture. We don't tell people how to give. It's between you and God. I can testify they gave beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And, and I believe the Holy Spirit really impressed this upon me over the last three months, and that is we have to make sure we've given ourselves first to God. So if you're here today and you don't even know what we're talking about, this relationship with Jesus Christ, somebody, one of our elders, our pastor, me, we want to help you become a follower of Jesus Christ. But if you're already a follower, we must, again, re-give ourselves to the Lord. Everything about us needs to be given to the Lord. We have farmers. I just met a couple. I'm sorry I forgot your names, but they're cattle farmers, chicken farmers. We have several farmers in this church, and you understand what it means to sow sparingly. Because if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. Give as you decide in your heart, not reluctantly, not out of compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Let me read 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11 for you. Listen to this. This is powerful stuff. Whoever sows sparingly reaps sparingly. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. Everyone must gift as they have decided in their heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The church Meyer and I attended in Bogila, Central African Republic, quoted this scripture every Sunday before we went up and put our money in the offering box. And that's what we had in Africa. We had little boxes we put our money in. God loves a cheerful giver. We're not to give reluctantly. We give what we decide in our heart. He's able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And then drop down to verse 11. You will be enriched in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. I want to introduce you to the most generous people I've ever known in my whole life. You want to guess who they are? That's my mom and dad. Wasn't she pretty? I never remember a mom like that. That's from business school in Birmingham. And dad, of course, this is when he was in the Navy. And so my mom was raised in southern Alabama, one of seven kids, oldest daughter of seven kids. Poor folk. My pop was raised in northern Alabama on Sand Mountain, um, one of 13 kids. And during World War II, he and four of his siblings were serving in the war. Two sisters and there were three boys, all served at the same time. My father was war-torn. And I actually Googled this to see if my demented father really remembered correctly. But the USS Bogue sunk five German U-boats, and one of the U-boats that they sunk had survivors. And my dad told me the story of them bringing the Germans on the boat and keeping them until they could take them to a prisoner of war camp. 
He told me only later in life that when he came home, he did not like black people, he did not like German people, he did not like Japanese people. That was his worldview. He was raised on Sand Mountain, northern Alabama, which was very racist. And then he goes to war and he sees death provoked by German people. And then he was redeployed to the Pacific where he saw death because of the Japanese people. And so he came home, and he was a young man, a carpenter, trying to raise his four boys, and he was hardened. He had a lot of bad habits. But when my dad died, I found his book that he had written for us kids. It's real simple. It's called Grandpa's Memories. And, and I ask any of you that are my age, start doing this. There's nothing more valuable than being able to read the things your parents thought before they pass away. And my pop says, in October of 58, in a Methodist church in Rock Island, Florida, I, it's, Grandpa, what is the most memorable event of your life? In 1968, in a church in Rock Island, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and this not only turned my life around, but the life of my family. Mike Taylor is what he is today because of that decision in 1958. My worldview is because of what my father taught me, what I observed in him, in this whole area of finances. My dad says the only new car we ever bought growing up, we were simple folk, all right, was a 1967 Chevy van. He was a carpenter. He needed it for, it was a cargo van. So when we were traveling north to go to our grandparents for, for holiday, uh, you could sit one in the driver, one in the passenger, and the engine was inside the van. So you could actually sit on the engine. Uh, there was no engine in the front. Well, that is a very important story. It was probably the most life-changing event of my father's life, more so than the war, because we were doing 70 miles an hour, 3 in the morning, came over a hill in Alabama. On the interstate were 13 cows big cows, and my pop just, <clears throat> no skid marks, no airbags, no jaws of life, no ambulances, and my dad languished in that van, stuck for six hours, broken legs, lost his kneecap, major surgeries. My brother Greg was sitting on the motor. He went flying into the windshield, suffered a lot of lacerations, almost bled out. My brother Doug was in the passenger seat. He broke his foot. I'm in the back sleeping on a mattress with my mother, and I already had a cast on from my big toe to my hip because I had already broken my leg. What's amazing about this is I remember as my dad was convalescing one Sunday morning <clears throat> hearing my mom crying. We had been in my grandparents' house for about two months. My dad was a carpenter. And the docs were telling him he probably wouldn't work the rest of the year. And while they lived very frugally, I still remember Mom saying, um, that's, oh, by the way, that's the van. I'm sorry, I didn't advance. Can't go back now. There it is. That's the van. It was a Polaroid picture, so not so good. I remember Mom saying, Gwen, we can't afford to give $5 to the church. Crying. So me and two of my brothers were getting ready for church, and at the time, I was in fourth grade. I still remember sitting in a corner, and I was so frightened because I, I just had never heard my mom cry like that. And my dad said, Sue, we can't afford not to give. Give the money. Now, my dad was a gentle, quiet man. He was a very strong carpenter, very quiet. Our personalities are very similar. I, I tend to be kind of a serious-looking dude most of the time, <laughs> and people are afraid of, afraid of me sometimes. And Pop was quiet. He wasn't mean to Mom that day. But she said, Gwen, you don't have a job. We don't have any money. We don't even know how we're going to get back to Fort Lauderdale. Dad said, give it. I still remember her taking five bucks because we'd gotten a check that week for $50 from somebody in Fort Lauderdale. Fast forward 39 years. My mother's deceased. My father has dementia. Not real bad, but starting to happen. And I thought, maybe if I took Pop on a trip down memory lane, let's go back and visit all the relatives in Birmingham. Let's go back to the house where he convalesced. And we went back to that house, and my aunt and uncle now own it. And I remember getting up in the morning, and I said, Pop, I hid in that corner when you and Mom had that confrontation. 
and you were on that couch right there for three months. We get in the car, and my father said, did I ever tell you what happened a week later? I said, no. So now I'm in my 40s, and I'd never heard this. He said, our pastor from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, drove 14 hours and handed my parents an envelope. And in that envelope, my dad said, was six months of income that sustained our family until my dad could get a part-time job at a desk until he could walk again. That event impacted my entire life because my dad learned the value of entrusting his money to God just like the widow did. My dad gave out of affliction and out of poverty. He, it was hard for my, my dad to do that. So why am I showing you this picture? Myra and I were just in Fort Lauderdale. I actually visited this very place three days ago. I wanted to remember it because every Saturday morning, my brothers and I had to take the family lawnmower. We went and knocked on doors and said, we'll cut your grass, okay? And we would go to the gas station. You see how much gas was? 25 cents a gallon, 27 cents a gallon. So we buy a gallon of gas and we go cut yards. And when we came home after doing that, we would sit down and we had to do three things. We had to get our hair cut. So dad used the old barber scissors, zzz, 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 like four swipes. Our head was bald all the time, four sweaty boys. Number two, you had to shine your shoes Saturday night so you'd look good on Sunday morning. Number three, you had to get your envelopes out and you had to bring your money to him and show him what you made. I usually made three bucks, all right? Because I usually did one lawn, I was a little guy. And the first thing he'd do is he'd pull out the church envelope and he'd say, how much you want to give, son? Well, I had in my brain the tithe thing, so I always would put 30 cents in there, okay? 10%. And then he'd say, okay, son, you don't have a choice on college you're going to save two bucks. So now I'm $2.30 gone. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> I worked hard cutting that yard, and so then what was left was 70 cents. You know what he used to say when he would give it, when he would give me 70 cents? This is your fund money, and if you waste it, it's going into your college fund. That's my worldview. I was raised at Whenever you get paid, Mike, remember to give to God first. Remember to save some and only play with a little bit of it. My dad could put Dave Ramsey out of business. <laughs> and if you will do what my dad said, you will be fine. And I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> give to God first. Paul said that on Sunday. Set aside a little bit. Just decide. Number two, hate debt. Hate consumer debt. Hate it with all your heart. Get rid of it. The seventh, the eighth wonder of the world is compounding interest in your favor. The worst wonder of the world is compounding interest in the favor of the credit card company. Because if you owe them a thousand, they're taking 21% every month. Hate debt. Number three, always save a little bit of money. Mike, always put a little bit aside. Number four, don't spend more than you make. And number five, help other people. I guarantee if you do that, you'll be able to do... Well, what happened here? I must have been pushing buttons while I was talking. That's all right. You do that, you'll be able to do what we did. So in 1989, Myra and me, our two little girls, jumped on a plane, flew to Central African Republic. Never been there in our life. Said we were going to go for two years. Committed two years. That was 34 years ago. God's given us a heart to help people in Africa, and then after the earthquake of 2010, to now help people in Haiti. So... Myra had to stay home and help raise kids, and so for seven years, she didn't go to Africa with me. I kept going twice a year. And so this image is a picture of Zinaba and Myra, the first time they're seeing each other after seven years. And Zinaba literally says to Myra, 
Hay que move o hay que venir foto. Is it really you or is it just another photograph? So this lady is a Muslim. She's a Fulani tribes person. And this lady sat on our front porch every day, four and five days a week. As Myra would cook, there was a window, and she could talk through the window to Zinaba because she had four girls. She had to fix food in Africa on a wood stove. Life was hard for Myra, but she interfaced with Zinaba every day, four days a week, for two, three years. And Zinaba gave her heart to the Lord, as well as her husband, Musa. But they died recently due to sectarian violence, hunger, illness. They're gone. Their son's still alive. Mukaira is still alive and still calls us frequently. Our church has decided that we're going to adopt these people. Let me tell you just a little bit about them before we finish up. There's 250,000 of them in a country the size of Texas, so it's not a lot. They're cattle herders, so they're very nomadic. The men tend to go out with the cattle. By the way, the women build the houses. The men don't build the houses. The women build the houses. The men are out with the cattle. They're starting to become more sedentary because as they travel throughout these countries, um, their cattle get stolen, they get held up by bandits, so they're saying, we're tired of this. Let's just live in the, in the village and learn how to farm, which is cool because we're teaching them how to farm. These are some of the most beautiful people on the face of the earth. Thin, tall, slender. They're not super dark. They're kind of brown. Their skin's olive. They're just beautiful people. The girls uh, and ladies dress in very bright colors. Most of them have tattoos on their faces. 99% Muslim. Less than 1% know Jesus Christ. Less than 1%. They stretch across the Sahel which starts in the Atlantic Ocean in Senegal and goes all the way to the Red Sea. So as far as you can go across the center of Africa in the Sahara Desert region, you will find Fulani people of all varieties. And we just happen to have 250,000 of them in our place. Now they wear amulets to protect themselves. And I, can't, can't, I don't know if you could imagine that woman all that she's having to wear around her neck to protect her, their little leather pouches and then this man was having respiratory issues, so we had him take his shirt off so I could listen to his heart and lungs. And I have to work through all these amulets. So they believe those amulets are going to protect them from evil, harm, illness. The men believe that if they're fighting, a bullet nor an arrow can go through their body if they have those amulets. They actually physically believe that. And their children are covered in them, they're covered in them. They also believe that it brings them good luck. Now, I'm going to let you see a video real quick on this guy that I met, a Fulani guy, and this just happened very, very recently. So he's never heard anything about Jesus. Isa. So this is the first time in this man's life he's ever heard anything about Jesus Christ. So that's Dr. Paul on the left. That's Nurse Jospin in the back. And that's a Fulani man living in Gamoko. He was traveling through with his cattle, probably 35. First time he ever heard the word Isa in his life. First time he ever heard the word Jesus. I'm going to finish with a Bible verse before I turn to it. It's an inspired verse because it's in the Word of God, so the Holy Spirit inspired. But the man that wrote it wrote three books of the Bible. He was a king for 40 years. He wrote over 3,000 Proverbs, 900 of, of which occur in our Bible. He was an expert in animals birds, reptiles, plants. Kings sent their wise men to listen to him talk. His net worth was $2 trillion. Think about Gates. Think about Bezo. Think about any big name you want to think of right now. Buffett. His net worth was twice theirs. This dude knew what he was talking about. Now, he had some problems, too, but he knew what he was talking about. And if you go to Proverbs 22 and verse 9, 
it says, whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed. Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed. And this is what I thought about for y'all today. This is not a message about Mike Taylor trying to encourage you to give money to a church. But this is a message about you developing and truly grasping the joy of giving to the kingdom of God to develop a bountiful eye. You know what a bountiful eye is? It's an eye looking for ways to be generous. It's an eye looking for those in need and helping them. And it says you will be blessed when you do that. This picture just occurred three days ago. This is my wife, a bountiful eye. She's always looking for ways to help people. This is little Ansley, nine months old. How many pounds, honey? Five pounds. Now, um, I forgot to bring my little, there you go. One of the measurements for malnutrition is to measure the upper arm. You can go home and measure your arm today. If your arm is less than 12.5 centimeters, you're severely malnourished. Ansley's arm was that big around. We measured it. Ansley's in the pediatric intensive care. I talked to Dr. T this morning, and Dr. T said Ansley's doing better. Thank God for my wife's bountiful eye, an eye looking for ways to be generous, looking for those in need and helping them out. How's the Holy Spirit spoken to you today? Because that's really what it's about. It's not my words, but it's what has the Spirit been saying to you? I always encourage people just to capture one line of what you think God taught you today, just one line, and then apply that in your life. Number two, Proverbs 22, 9. Pray for a bountiful eye. Pray that as you go about our community, that you're looking, you're not reacting, but you're being proactive and looking for ways to help people. And then finally, we're going to have a meeting of the people that are interested in helping with the Fulani. So if you're interested, put it on the connection card. All right? I'm done. I'm going to pray real fast. And I just want to tell you all, I love being able to speak the Word of God. And I'm just so thankful for my mother and my father that taught me and that taught Myra. And now we're trying to do the same thing with our kids, to have a bountiful eye. Dear God in heaven, I praise your name this morning. I am so thankful for you. I am so thankful for the word of God. I am so thankful that you reached down and you saved my soul as a little boy. And Father, Myra and I want... We just want to take the talents you've given us and the resources you've given us, and we want to give back to your kingdom. Dear God in heaven, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in the hearts and minds of each and every person sitting in here today. If there's someone who doesn't know you personally, that they would come up to me or Pastor Reg and, and ask us, what's this all about? And uh, we just commit our day to you. We commit this message to you through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray it all. Amen.